You had cranked off in that class, you ready to change gears and talk about your voice sales. Was that mortgage? Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, uh, Bill McCormick and East McCormick uh, were the uh, owners of CK Capital Management. Um, I was saying to Tori earlier, we've actually been in here a couple different times. So, uh, the McCann team had a saying here with the Walnut Street office before. Um, uh, and again, we're going to specifically talk about short sales today and how can you differentiate, differentiate yourself in today's market. How many of you have ever been involved in a short sale on the west side? All right. Yeah. How about high side? Okay. All right. Good. Um, some of you have never been involved in a short sale before. Okay. So um, where I typically like to start is um, where does the market go? Okay, because for those of you that have never been involved in a short sale before, you've got market values, market values below what a homeowner can sell for to pay off the debt in full. Okay, and there's some type of financial hardship. Well, these last two, three years, right, the market's been going crazy, and there's not a lot of folks out there that don't have equity. But as the market changes, which is what we're starting to see now, is folks that have, <clears throat> excuse me, fell behind during the pandemic. Um, they actually got a haul pass from the federal government. There, weren't, there wasn't a whole lot of foreclosure action. Now, the lenders are all waking up. Beginning of 23, they're starting to foreclose, okay? So um, one of the things that we were talking about earlier to me is that we are seeing more and more short sales in the Philadelphia market. Um, Denise and I, Denise and I'll tell you a bit about us here uh, in a minute. But um, we've been facilitating short sales in the Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland region for 21 years. This isn't anything new, okay? But for those of you that have been involved in this market in this last couple of years, multiple offer situation, people overpaying, they're waiving inspections, waiving appraisals. Well, you know, there's a cause and effect to that. We've never seen anything like that in our 20 years. So what we have now. People that got in a competitive situation two and a half, three years ago, or were paid, weren't planning on a job loss, weren't planning on um, uh, getting divorced, weren't planning on maybe one of the uh, borrowers uh, uh, getting sick or, or dying. All of a sudden, they can't afford the mortgage anymore. And they realized that with the change in the interest rates, okay, they got in a three and a half and they bought a $400,000 house. Well, that same house today at a seven and a half interest rate, all of a sudden people aren't willing to pay that money for that house. So they, that's the shift we're seeing. So um, I always look at Realty Track. Um, Realty Track, they track all the foreclosure data across the entire country. They do it down to the state level, down to the city level, town level, down to the zip code. So uh, again, if anybody's interested in that market, Realty Track is the problem. But let me give you the flavor for it, where it is right now. Philadelphia County, all right, everybody here does business in Philadelphia County, I'm assuming, all right? Would you believe there are over 1,200 foreclosures right now in Philly, Philly County? Yeah. 1,200. Um, I had a client that foreclosed on a Yeah, of uh, foreclosures and and, and mm -hmm. well, and I think and I'm glad you brought that up because their their the banks had turned these off for two and a half years during the pandemic. Uh, if you had a federal bank loan, if you had a Fannie Freddie FHA VA USDA loan, March 2020 through the end of 22, lenders weren't able to foreclose on you. Okay, they weren't able to foreclose because the Fed said. We don't want you kicking people out during the pandemic. So we are seeing clients right now haven't paid a mortgage in five years. I was with Denise and I were talking to Vinny earlier. You haven't paid a mortgage for four or five years. I don't care how much the property bags have gone up. Every month you don't make a payment, your balance goes up. And then you get late charges and everything like that on top of that. So Philadelphia County over 1,200. Delaware County right now, over 375 foreclosures. And then I'll, I'll also did Montgomery County, 372, all right? Um, they're all pretty similar, right? I mean, obviously Philadelphia being what it is, but from our experience and our background, it always starts in the city, 
and then it makes its way out into the suburbs. Okay, so there are going to be more and more distressed property owners, and I and I have to caveat: short sale simply means that a homeowner is short of a full payoff. That all means that's all it means. I don't have enough equity in my home to pay builder commission to pay uh, transfer city city tax right state transfer tax title company fees if i have a second mortgage if i have irs liens i've come with pa liens i don't have enough equity to pay up all my debt i'm short of a full pay okay but the other part of that is is that you know if they're short of a full payoff and they lost their job they have some type of financial hardship they would be considered for a short sale. You're going to come across a lot of homeowners that can't afford the mortgage anymore. But they have equity, right? Just because someone's delinquent on a mortgage doesn't make them our client. They're not a short sale if they have equity. You could be delinquent, right? But have $100,000 in equity. Hey, I can't afford my mortgage anymore. You got equity, sell your home, take the equity, and go live to fight another debt, right? It's the folks that don't have that equity. And what we're seeing is, is a transition in the market where you're gonna get some folks that have equity, right? Some folks that don't. So they may be a short sale, maybe they are not. Here's the other thing that, you know, this market, as I said, we're, we're kind of in that transition that in the past, right? If I couldn't afford my mortgage anymore and I had equity, I would go to my mortgage company. I would say, hey, you know what? I need to refinance, right? I need it. I got a lot of equity. I want to refinance my rate. Guess what? If you locked in at a three and a half a couple of years ago, you're not going to refinance to a seven and a quarter, right? That option is gone. So that's what I'm saying. You may have folks that say, "Hey, I, I, I can't refinance. I've got equity, but I need to get out." Okay. All right, Mitch. You want to talk a little bit about? Who we are, what we do. So our company, as Bill said, we've been facilitating short sales for over 21 years, the ups and the downs. We want to be brought in when you identify that your person may possibly be a short sale. We come in, we get third party authorization. We can request the payoffs from the bank, you reach out to the bank to determine if in fact the property is going to be sold as a short. We will have a mortgage and judgment search pool to determine because perhaps the mortgages can be paid off in full, but if the individual wasn't paying or paying the mortgage, they or were paying the mortgage or whatever, they might not have been paying the IRS, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, or other things. So why all short sales are not for the mortgages? They're for the Fed and for the Commonwealth of PA. So you might be able to pay off both of those loans, but you shocked how many IRS loans people have, unfortunately, out there now. So we come in, we talk to the seller, we typically get a lot more information than they might give you. They unload on us, so we'll do a consultation, get the authorization, get the payoffs in, and then we'll facilitate everything through the process. We see it through closing. We don't wait until there's an offer. We try and start the process as much as we can up front, because those of you that did short sales in the past, I'm sure you heard the nightmare stories. Oh my gosh, it's a short sale. Does it take a year? I heard they take nine months. I heard they take a year. They don't, it's about three, 45 days is the typical timeline because we're getting involved up front. We're getting a lot of that front end work done. And then when the offer comes in, if the bank ordered an appraisal, we've already got that approved short sale place. There is zero impact to your commission bringing our company in. We never have any more will we ever take a dime from agents of uh, commission. We get paid through a credit from the bank that they will give up we are a line item on the buyer side of the settlement sheet, just the credit and the debit. If they're a cash buyer, they know where they're. If they're a finance buyer, they ask for three percent sellers assist to offset our fee. We're not a premium. Um, the most important thing to remember though is just bring us in up front, even if in fact it's not going to be a short sale. Then we just step away and you carry on. There's no fee to us, it's just we're going to come in and, and help you. And if it is a short sale, we, we see it in the credit process. Like I said, we'll clear HOA, we clear every lien. Title companies get our files and, and they love it. They're like, oh my gosh, there's five liens on title. We're like, 
And again, we did it all through the whole short sale process. So it gets you to the table. Now, is that for Delaware and Jersey? Pennsylvania, we do it every Yeah, Denise and I have been, we, we sponsor polls. I mean, where our market is basically southeastern Pennsylvania, so Philly, down through Delaware, down through Maryland and Virginia. Um, I, have, I have a group, we also belong to Miami Board of Real Estate. I have a KW group in like the Miami Day. There's four offices down there. I teach with them. He has a KW group in Hawaii. Um, they have five offices across the island. She's been working with them for years. So, um, but we can do them anywhere. We're not realtors, we're not attorneys, right? This is a niche that we have. Been at it 21 years. So, to Denise's point, don't be afraid to see IRS. The IRS can be your friend. Believe it or not, the regional IRS, um, when you have to negotiate lien releases, guess what? They're right here in downtown Philadelphia. Okay. So we're not that difficult. Commonwealth of PA gets a little more difficult. Question. So um, I was dealing with the short sale aspect because you're in Yeah, so, and that's, the, and I can say yes and yes. So the question was, do the banks want to do a, a short sale or do they want to take their property back at an auction, right? Is that more or less your question? Okay. So the reality is that, that mortgage companies do not want to take property back. The mortgage companies own the mortgage note. They don't own the asset, right? In Pennsylvania, it's a judicial process. If I, I'm Bank of America, and Denise defaults on her loan on her mortgage, I go through the court system. I got to hire an attorney. It's going to take me at least 12 months to get through the court system, right? The whole while, I'm not getting my monthly payment, okay? So, so it, it, and the lenders don't want to be property owners because once I take that property back, if I take the property back from Denise at an auction, right, a sheriff's auction, now the property's in my name as Bank of America. Now I got to handle the taxes. Now I got to maintain the order. Now I got to do all that. Banks don't want to do that, right? When someone's delinquent, the lender starts sending out notices, collection notices, and then they start sending out letters to say, here are your options. Have you considered a loan modification? Have you considered a refinance? Have you considered what's called a deed in lieu, where you hand the deed over before foreclosure? How you consider a short sale? The lenders are actually educating consumers now that there's a short sale. Now, flip side, homeowners done nothing. All right, they haven't engaged you to list their home, and sheriff sales three weeks out. All right, well that lender isn't going to postpone the sheriff sale because they know right now where the property values are. Okay, so in in, in Pennsylvania now we it's an online called Bid for Assets, BidForAssets.com. So I can go online, I can bid on any property. I can be in any, any part of the country. I can bid on a property down in South Philly, all right? You don't know as an investor, are you bidding against the bank? Are you bidding against another investor, all right? Where are they from? So the banks know that if they do take it to share or sale, odds are the property is going to get bid up, all right, by an investor. It's going to get bid up. And they may get more, but that's only if the homeowner did not explore the option. Most lenders, if they have an offer, a contract in hand, they will postpone a scheduled sheriff sale. They need it in hand about 37 days prior to, right? Let me give you an example. Down in Wilmington, we've got an estate sale, three properties, okay? About 400,000 of IRS liens and judgments, all right? So two sisters are the heirs. They're trying to clear out the estate. And one of the properties uh, goes to a city tax sale, right? Just, just three weeks ago, okay? It's a condo in downtown Wilmington. Condo, one bedroom, maybe it's worth 65 grand. Maybe, okay? The city tax sale was $21,000 is what was owed on back taxes, all right? Guess how much an investor paid for that? $121,000. For a property that's worth 65. Here's how it works in Delaware. 
that investor that bought that tax lien, right? He'll get, I know it's a he, he'll get his, his 21,000 that he paid for the tax lien. He'll probably get about another 10 to 15, all right, in excess that'll go to him. Everything else goes to pay off the IRS, goes to pay off the state of Delaware. He paid over a hundred thousand dollars over and above what it was listed today. Here's the problem. The investors have the same problem Joe and Sue homeowner had. No inventory. No inventory. So to go back to your point, if the homeowner did not engage uh, to an, an agent to list their property and they wait for the last minute, they're not going to postpone the sale. The reality is they want to and they encourage that homeowner to engage. Okay. Um, all right. We're going to talk about today. Differentiate yourself in, in today's market. Again, not having done short sales before, this is something you can add add to the mix, right? How do you identify opportunities that are out there? And the whole idea here is how can, how can we educate you to help grow your business to make service clientele that you haven't serviced before, okay? Um, how do you market those properties once you do secure the listing and avoid common mistakes? And this is the problem that we're seeing right now is there are so many agents that weren't in this market 2007, 8, 9, so they're not experienced in it, all right? And adults learn by doing, but the reality is you don't want to be in the middle of a transaction and realize, oh my gosh, I didn't think to ask if they had a second mortgage. Oh my gosh, I didn't think to ask if they weren't paying their mortgage. Do they have credit card debt? All these things can make your transaction go sideways, okay? Um, and <laughs> with that being said, how do you protect yourself and your sellers? Okay. Denise is going to give us some examples as we go through this um, of, of, of uh, transactions where agents made a mistake and, and it cost their, their client and put them in a bad situation. Not only the client, but themselves as far as their license. All right. Um, I would keep on going. All right. Definition of a short sale, we've already said. All right, short simply means they're short of a full payoff, okay? But because of that, okay, you're, as a homeowner, I can't afford my mortgage anymore. Let's say I'm five, six months late when, and I meet with you and, and you say, hey, look, I pulled comps, comps afford 300 grand. Well, that's a problem because I owe 350, right? So I, I, you've identified that they're short of that full payoff. Well, a homeowner, can't sell a property and give clear title to a buyer if they're not satisfying all their liens and judgments, okay? So as it relates to mortgage one, or if there's two mortgages, okay, that offer needs to be presented to the mortgage company because it's the mortgage company that's taking the loss. So the mortgage, mortgage company needs to issue a short sale approval letter to that home when they're saying yes, all right, we understand you owe us 350, but it's under contract for 300. We are willing, Bank of America, to take a loss. And we're going to issue that approval letter to you, homeowner. Right now, that approval letter also serves as a payoff to the buyer's title company. If the buyer's getting a mortgage, that approval letter goes to the title company and it goes to the mortgage underwriter for the buyer because the title company needs to make sure everything's made free and clear. Question. So you mentioned if there's a second mortgage, how does it work in that situation? Um, you know, especially if the the especially if the value of the property is less than even what one mortgage is owed. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would assume that both banks would have to sign off on it. Correct. Do you see situations where banks essentially wipe their hands of it if they're the second mortgage, or do they negotiate with the first bank to figure out who's getting what? Yeah, great question. Yeah. Like if, if we're facilitating or you're doing issuance up on your own, you have to do the negotiating with each of these those lien holders. So the first though, let's say the first is a Fannie Mae back one. This is why like you have to be careful going down the path of negotiating short sale. If you've not done it, do you have to be a market scientist? No, but if the first is servicing for Fannie Mae and you have a junior, it's government guidelines that you can only get six grand. Do you know that? Probably not if you didn't do a short sale beforehand. If it's a VA backed loan, 
you can you only get the second 15 grand and the seller can walk away with 15 grand there are so many holes behind the scenes that you really need to know what you're doing when you're negotiating with the first and the second because that second only have to come in happen before this Americans, you know, Fannie Mae, I want fifteen thousand dollars. Well, no, you're violating the government guidelines, and we have snaps of that. We send it off to them, and boy, don't they change their tune. But what if you didn't know the challenge on that? You went to the buyer, and the buyer said, "I'm not going to pay this much more." Forget about it. If you lose the buyer, the person gets pushed to foreclosure. But there are very set rules as to what each one will take, and the banks pretty much follow them. Where there's the biggest issue, and we've seen this as of late, which is a very new thing, maybe to the next one on in the market, but if the first lien is getting paid off in full, seconds are night, they're like, they need to go take a short. Well, why would they take a short? They can take it to auction and wipe you out. Don't care. We don't know if there's some insurance claim behind the scenes. Is there some bad? What the heck is going on that they do not want to negotiate? When they see the first getting paid in full, they're saying, we're not, I mean, we have a first, um, I mean, the values of the house is worth maybe 400000 for the property. The buyer's paying like fifteen grand over. There's about 6000 left for the second because the first ones get their money in full. They want 125000 Where are you going to get 125000 It's not worth five hundred and fifty. Don't care. Then let the first tell the first to foreclose and we'll figure it out. So there must be something behind the scenes. Some kind of payout is all right, because why would you let that happen? That's been a new thing as of late. Jack Joker rule of thumb for years, and it's whether it's a Bank of America in first position or Bank of America in second position, JP Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo. The general rule of thumb is if both lenders are taking a short sale. So let's say it's Wells Fargo first, JP Morgan second, right? If Wells Fargo is taking loss, they typically won't offer that second lien holder anything more than 10% of what's owed. And, and but it's typically capped at about six thousand yeah. dollars. So if they could be owed a hundred uh, on the second, the most they're going to get is six. But to go back to your original question, you have to present it to both because both need to be willing to release the lien to provide clear title to a buyer. Okay, there's any comment um, that to Depends on it. I mean, if, if it is a government back loan, they will work because you have the government guidelines. But if it's a private investor, like a hedge fund company or somebody holding that first note, then they don't want to give the second as much money as the second wants. But is your deal going to fall apart? No, they also don't care if a buyer gives some money to the second. So the buyer might say, well, I don't care, I'll pay 5000 more, I'll give it to the second. So there's always a way to work through it. Um, so we already talked about the equity. So, you know, and people say all the time, like you'll see in the, in the multi-listing, you'll see short sale. And a lot of times if, if, we're, if we're negotiating a short sale, if the listing agent that brings us in will put us in the MLS disclosures, you know, hey, there's a company, there's a fee-based company, um, but they're going to do all the negotiating. So our phone rings and it, it'll be a buyer, buyer's agent saying, hey, I see you're doing the short sale. Um, have they been pre-approved? Okay. Short sale by definitions, you know, you talk about being short of the full payoff, right? But sale means there's a contract for sale, right? The lenders aren't going to approve somebody for a short sale until they get a contract because I could be owed 350, right? But I don't know how much of a loss you're expecting me to take because I don't know what you're selling. So once the contract goes in, that's when all this starts. So again, two things, right? Are you upside down on the mortgage? You can't afford payment? Yes. Is there tongue some type of financial distress, right? Which is where we're going to next. Okay. But when you're going out and with a homeowner, does anybody do a net sheet? you're meeting with a homeowner and let them know how much money they're going to walk away from. Same calculation, okay? But guess what? Joe and Sue homeowner may not tell you out of the gate that they're going to on the mortgage, right? Joe and Sue homeowner may not even know what their house is. The first time they may understand that they're upside down in the mortgage is when they meet with you 
All right, have you ever worked with a homeowner that thought the house was worth more than you did? Right, all the time. Okay, so you know, homeowners being are really struggling and can't afford it anymore. You know, I'm gonna have you come out and tell me what market value is. Well, what's market value? Well, I think we can sell anywhere from 275 to 300. That's a problem. I owe 350. A lot of homeowners may not even know they're a short sale until you meet with them and you show them exactly what comps support. Okay, but how do you figure that out? Just like you do the net sheet, right? Get a payoff, right? Figure out what it's going to market, what you can sell it for. Add in closing fees. Figure out what's the net. You know, in a short sale, right? The payoff is two thirty, but you can only sell for one ninety five. You have to do the calculation. In this scenario, that homeowner is fifty thousand dollars short. Okay, and you know, one of the things that we always recommend, and and almost, you know, if you're doing a short sale. I would say don't move forward without it is get a payoff. Don't go by the mortgage statement, right? There's a reason why the title company, you know, a couple weeks before settlement, reaches out to the seller's bank or mortgage companies and say, give me a payoff valid for 30 days because they have to fund that money and make sure the bank doesn't want to come after them after settlement. So you were $1,000, you didn't give it give us enough money. The title company doesn't say, hey, homeowner, give me a copy of your mortgage statement. Mortgage statements are not an accurate reflection of what's owed, particularly if there's an attorney involved because you got attorney's fees, late charges, things like that. So you always, if someone's delinquent, get a payoff, get a payoff. Do um, you want to talk about that one scenario with Leanne? Yes, um, this just recently happened. It's actually still in complaint mode, I guess. Um, so we got called in, um, I believe about a week and a half before settlement. It was with Leanne of our own well, not she was representing the buyer. The listing agent of Omega Brokerage, um, they were working with an individual who was in a state sale. So the beneficiary um, reached out. He said, oh, great, looked at a payoff statement. Um, and said, I can sell it for this. So told her she was going to be walking away with maybe, I don't know, I think $60,000, $80,000 to go into the estate. Um, gets it under contract. The, con the um, buyer walked because they found a bunch of stucco issues. So he said, hey, we're going to be able to sell this better than getting 80 grand. Go do some stucco repairs. So she put $20,000 into this to do some stucco repairs. Then um, they get another buyer, great, buyer's happy as can be, buyer sold their house, um, moves forward, and again, a full payoff sell. beneficiary still thinks she's walking away with money. Oh, that other buyer did inspections and would talk in for even another 10 grand after the stock deal. Um, payoff comes in, $120,000 upside down after the error. Spent 30 grand thinking she's walking away with 80, mm -hmm. and the, per, the buyer sold their home ready to close in a week and a half, so they had to get out of their house. There was no option. The aunt had to put them into an Airbnb, and it became a short sale. And this is under whatever we'll do at this point because of what went down. That's why Bill's saying the agents do get brought back into it when errors like that happen. What happened is that listing agent, unfortunately, didn't do their due diligence up front. The mortgage had been made for years. They went by a mortgage statement. There were no attorney's fees calculated, and it was up $100,000 off. Um, and it wound up getting to the settlement table. The buyers were happy as can be. The same buyers stayed in there. Like I said, the man found the Airbnb and had them in there for another month and a half after that. But that was all because up front the due diligence was not done, and they just went on an assumption of over that whole entire year from losing the first buyer to losing the next one, no payoff was ever obtained on that. The original mortgage statement from the fall or like December of last year was what was being used up until oh, then they went by a verbal. That's what happened like maybe three weeks before closing, somebody called in and the verbal was the person at the bank was reading an unpaid principal. Didn't read any So of the end result was the seller, the estate, and the buyer both filed ethics complaints. Right? Filed ethics complaints. Think about it, right? Denise did mention that the buyer was like seven months pregnant. 
sold their home had nowhere to go. Right? Imagine if these couldn't have gotten it done, gotten short sale approved. Now you've got a buyer that sold their house and have nowhere to go. Who do you think they're going to sue? They're going to sue everybody, right? Right? Just, and if you were just talking with Tori about it, because she was talking about she filed the, the complaint uh, for Leanne. So that's why you want to be careful on these distressed property owners do your due diligence. Okay. Um, financial hardship, right? The most common reason for, for financial hardship, I've lost my job. You get downsized, your hours are cut back, you lose your job altogether, you're out to find a new job making less money. You can't afford the mortgage anymore, right? Job loss is the most recognizable hardship in the eyes of the mortgage companies, the Bank of America, the Wells Fargo. Second most common is divorce, dual income families, right? They both get approved for a mortgage independently. They can't afford to maintain the property, the mortgage, and all the living costs. Um, second thing is death, and then you got medical illness. Um, one of the trends that we are seeing, we we're talking about this with Vinny earlier, is we are seeing um, a, a, a spike in estate short sales. And we're seeing a spike in reverse mortgage short sales, right? Anybody not familiar with reverse mortgage? Okay. All right. Can you want to talk about how to do it? So a reverse mortgage short sale is um, somebody owes their home Okay, there can't be any other mortgage and liens or judgments against the property, the, the reverse mortgage company. So you go to a mortgage company, that individual, and they apply for a reverse mortgage. The mortgage, the loan officer is going to do a calculation. You're 70 years old, your house appraised here, we expect you to live for this long, we're going to give you this much money. So it's a way for the individual to get the money out of their own without selling and moving. So they can get that money in three different ways. They can say, okay, I'm entitled to 300,000. Give me 300. It's going to help me pay for my electric, my groceries, live, stay in my house. Or give me monthly jobs and they'll get maybe 1500 or $2,000 a month. Or they can take a line of credit. Give me just a line of credit and I'm going to go draw on it as I, as I need it. The bulk of the people take all the money. Why we're seeing an uptick in these reverses is they took all the money and they outlived the money. So when they did the reverse, 08, 09, they're still alive. They ran through that money. They pass away, the adult children closing out the estate realize when they get the payoff, that mom and dad's reverse mortgage is now $100,000, $50,000, whatever, upside down. How it becomes that upside down is these are federally backed, probably 99% of housing called FHA backed, right? Housing and urban development backed. So there is a insurance payment that you are to pay when you get that money every month, like maybe $1,000. But if you're not paying that over the lifetime, that balance is ticking up really, really quick. So the bulk of them upside down because the person could be staying there for like 10 years after they have run out of money. Because you still, you don't get more close. You stay in the home on a reverse until you die, okay? Or until you move into an assisted living. The bulk of them are the adult children discover the reverse, discover it's upside down, and realize that it needs to be sold as a short sale. Do they have any financial impact? Is there any financial impact on any of the beneficiaries or the heirs? No. So the question always becomes, why would I tell the heir that they want to sell the property if it doesn't matter to them? It could be foreclosed upon. They'll get nothing out of it. Um, several reasons. Some of them just say, my mom would be turning it upside down in the grave if they knew I left closed. I mean, simple as that. They want to sell the family house they grew up in. Some of them, if they're, um, if the homeowners association would be paying the taxes, if you have a reverse, you can't get it out of your name, you can't close out the estate, you can't do the inheritance tax. Everything that needs to be done with an estate sale, unless you sell the so the bulk of them want to sell the property so that they can get everything closed out and move on because it will take years for their money to foreclose on somebody that passes away. They've got to bring in the state attorneys. It is a very long process. So if you want to cause somebody 
wanting to sell and it's an estate and or it's a reverse mortgage the the big thing you have to look out for is because everybody heard about the inheritance tax filing in pennsylvania you can't sell the property they have to hold back money at closing until the inheritance tax filing is done is there any money on a short sale to hold back um, a mortgage company is not going to allow a line item for fifteen thousand dollars to be held out once the heir goes and closes it out. So if you're doing a reverse mortgage short sale, we connect them with an attorney we know and get that covered through the sale proceeds, and they handle the estate filing so that there doesn't have to be any holdback of money. So make sure you have somebody that understands what they're doing before you get on that path. But we are seeing a lot of reverses, a lot of estates, and a lot of, we are talking to Vivi about the three things we're really seeing right now as far as the short sales, and it's divorces, people buying in the last two years, estates and reverse. So just a uh, sphere of influence, okay? Reach out to your divorce attorneys, reach out to your estate attorneys. That's where we're getting our phone calls from, right? That's where we're getting our phone calls from. All right, so foreclosure, okay? And I said earlier, Pennsylvania, um, is, is a judicial state, meaning I cannot, uh, as Bank of America, take the property back at a sheriff's auction unless I go through the legal process. So basically, I have to hire a local attorney. The attorney goes into the courthouse. They do what's called a civil filing. It's known as a LIS pendants, L-I-S, P-E-N-D-I-N-S, pending litigation, right? So once that attorney goes into the courthouse, you know, they file that, that filing. Now, Wells Fargo, all right, is now in active foreclosure with that homeowner. Guess what? Sheriff shows up at the homeowner's house, all right? And they put a package about that thick, right? It's it's who's the attorney that's representing the, the mortgage company. Here's a copy of your mortgage. Here's a copy of your deed. You're officially in foreclosure, okay? Typically, what we see um, in, in the surrounding Philadelphia area counties um, it, it takes about six months from it that that service notice, the sheriff shows up, that you're actively in foreclosure, about six months before there's an actually a sheriff's sale. The sheriff's sale is only the means that the mortgage company uses to take back its asset, right? That process, okay, typically what we see is after five to six months of missed payments, the mortgage company hires that attorney. Once the civil filing is, is done, it's another five to six months before there's a sheriff's sale. So, so figure first missed payment to sheriff's sale if they take the property back on average 12 months, okay? So if you're meeting with a homeowner and you're listing a property, they tell you they're delinquent. Ask the question, when did you last make your mortgage payment? Well, I, I, I think it's probably been a couple months now. Um, you know, that's why I'm calling you or I realize I can't save my home. Okay, well, it's only a couple months, right? You get 12 months, okay? A couple months, you got plenty of time. Next question, have you received your foreclosure papers? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I just got them, right? Go out six months from then, right? Six months before there's a potential sheriff's sale. Because what you don't want is that homeowner, and it happens probably two to three times a month, we get a phone call from um, an agent that we worked with before, Hey, Bill, hey, Denise, I got a phone call from the seller. They want me to get the property on the market tomorrow. They've got a share of sale in three weeks. Right? Don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. I said earlier, the mortgage companies, they need an offer in hand 37 days prior to a scheduled share of sale. Okay? That homeowner that stuck their head in the sand, waited, waited, waited. Now the sheriff's, you know, there's a share of sale schedule. Now they're going to waste your time because they think, you know what? Maybe if I just list the property, maybe that'll buy me more time. Have you ever had a client waste your time before? Right? Right? Trust me, someone's in the process of potentially being kicked out of their house. They're going to waste your time, anybody else's time. Right? If they've got a sheriff's sale, move on to the next one. Not worth your time. Right? Okay. So, all right. How do you benefit in a short sale? Obviously, short sale. All right, is foreclosure avoidance. That all that's all it is. If you want to, you know, you know, people get frustrated all the time. You know, the mortgage companies put it, put them through the ringer and they say, you know what, let the bank just take it back. I don't want it anymore. All right, I'm done. 
And they think just by saying that, it magically all goes away. It doesn't, right? Let's use the example, $300,000 mortgage, okay? Well, if the bank forecloses, they take a property back at sheriff's sale. Now I have a judgment for 300 grand against me, okay? Let's say the bank then puts it back on the market. Maybe they sell it for 250. Okay, well, maybe now that judgment gets reduced to $50,000. Guess what? I have a judgment against me. They can attach my wages. Right? They can do whatever they want because I defaulted on a mortgage obligation, right? If you have a two dollars $300,000 judgment, good luck getting a car loan. Good luck getting a Pottery Barn or Lowe's or Home Depot credit card. Not with a $300,000 judgment. Putting your head in the sand and walking away isn't the answer. That's why the lenders now put in a letter to those homeowners, you know, have you considered these options? One of them being a short sale, because we're going to show you a minute how it reports on your credit. But here's the thing. We said earlier that short sales, there's no proceeds, right? Well, you're signing a listing agreement, right? Because homeowner, out of their proceeds, they pay commission, transfer tax, city tax, okay? They pay title companies. In a short sale, there's no equity, there's no proceeds. You're signing a list agreement with a homeowner that has no ability to pay you, right? In a short sale, guess what? The bank, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan Chase, they will pay realtor commission. They will pay transfer tax. They will pay recordation fees, title company fees, right? So that homeowner is not writing a check for their customer and closing fees, okay? And here's, here's the key benefits. Obviously, getting your, your closing fees paid, that's benefit number one. This is boilerplate language. Every short sale approval letter, when Denise and I are negotiating short sales, whether it's from Bank of America or Mr. Cooper or TD Bank, we want to see the approval letter. We want to see the, this language in there. One is, you know, it says um, uh, in, in the letter, I'll just kind of paraphrase it. Bank of America agrees to report your debt as settled for less than owed or settled for less than full amount, right? Well, what does that mean? Settled means no judgment, right? Foreclosure, judgment, okay? Judgment, longer time period to get approved for a new mortgage, okay? So they agree to report the debt as settled for less than owed. And what does that less than owed mean? All right, we're gonna talk about the credit part of that in a little bit. And then the other thing is, they also put in writing that Bank of America agrees to waive the deficiency balance, waive the shortfall amount. So that $50,000 that we showed you earlier, that shortfall, all right, in a short sale, the lenders, all right, allow that homeowner to walk away and not have to pay it back. Because what they're saying is, homeowner, if you're willing to work with us, we're willing to take less than what's owed because we don't want to have to take it back at the sheriff's auction. It's going to cost us more time and money and, and, and effort, right? So because of that, all right, the benefit to you is going to be to pay your closing fees. After settlement, right, we're going to go to Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion, and we're going to let them know that your debt is settled for less than full amount, all right? So you're no longer obligated to pay us. And as a matter of fact, we're going to waive that deficiency balance. That, that shortfall amount is known as forgiven debt, okay? Now, forgiven debt may have taxable consequences, okay? It may have, doesn't always have, all right? So um, does anybody here have a mortgage? Right? So every January, you get your 1098C, your mortgage introduction, right? Well, any short sale or foreclosure that occurs in 2023, all right, in January of next year, all right, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan Chase, they send out their 1099 seats. And in their approval letter, it says, we will report the forgiven debt to the IRS and issue you, this is by law, they have to issue a 1099 C for that $50,000. So, you know, Bank of America, if they're writing off 50 grand on their tax return, they have $50,000 loss. Uncle Sam, IRS says, wait a minute, this is a debt obligation. You're supposed to be paid money. If you're getting a tax write-off, who got the benefit of it? You have to issue them a 1099-C, all right? Well, okay, and depending on 
what my tax bracket is. Let's just use simple math. Let's say I'm in the 10% tax bracket, 10% of 50 grand. I would have to pay Uncle Sam $5,000, right? There's a but, okay? Bless you. Congress um, enacted back in 2007, um, it was called Mortgage Debt Services Relief Act. It only applies, applied and applies today to a primary residence, not a second home down the shore, not an investment property here in the city. It, it, is, it was my home. I've lived in the property two and a half of the last five years as my primary residence. That's reflected on my tax return, okay? The way this is, <clears throat> the way this was originally rolled out is if it was just bill on the mortgage, I didn't have to pay any forgiven debt up to $250,000. If it were bill on the lease on the mortgage, we didn't have to pay any forgiven debt up to half a million dollars, right? That's forgiven debt. That's not sales price. Back in 2007, 8, 9, when this was first really rolled out, we were doing short sales. People were walking up to $600,000. Easy, easy, okay? So, right here's how it works all right so congress this went away at the end of 2017 congress went and they renewed this in december 2020 for the previous three years that had gone away and they extended this through 2025 so now right it only applies to primary residences okay but now the thresholds have gone way up or the ceiling i should say has gone way up for an individual, you don't have to pay any income tax up to $375,000 in forgiven debt. For a couple, up to $750,000 in forgiven debt. All right. A couple of years ago, before this was renewed, um, I had actually a, a Keller Williams agent over on the main line, and um, it was Bill Nova Address. It was a $600,000 shortfall. The One of the owners happened to be a corporate accountant here in Philly. And I said, look, this is before it was renewed. This was October 2020. I said, you're going to pay income tax. Oh, I you know. I'm looking at about 160 grand. This was renewed a month and a half later in, 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 um, uh, in, in December. And we closed in January. And that $160,000, she didn't have to pay one dime. One dime, right? I think she's going to remember that agent that helped her out of that mess, right? She didn't pay any income tax on it. I use that as an egregious example. I mean, it was like it was mainline bill number. You know, it was like probably, you know, I think we got under contract for one point three, and they had close to two. But my point in saying that is, what about the person that makes seventy hundred grand and they get forgiven seventy five, right? They have to pay income tax on a job they never had and money they never spent. Okay, don't give tax advice if you're working with a homeowner that's doing a short sale. Say, look. I can't give you tax advice. Go talk to your accountant and see if you can qualify for the mortgage debt services. Again, primary residence, as long as you lived in it two and a half for the last five years, have you proven that? What's the address on your tax? Okay. All right. So, benefit one, they pay my closing fees. Two, they report that that is settled. Three, they gave the deficiency balance. Four, I don't pay any income tax. Okay. Now, what about my credit? What about my credit? We get asked all the time, you know, well, if, if my credit score is going to take a hit, um, I'm not going to do a short sale, right? Are you not paying your mortgage? No. Congratulations, you're already doing damage to your credit report. One of the biggest drivers of your credit score is how you pay your mortgage, right? But here's the thing. Most mortgage people, we can ask the gentleman who just left what, what his experience is, but most local mortgage people tell us this. They can put somebody in a new mortgage about two and a half to three years after they do a short sale because the debt reports a seven. Bankruptcy, seven years. Foreclosure, anywhere to five to seven years before they can qualify for a new mortgage. That's why the short sale is beneficial because that settled for less than owed isn't in long term, it's usually two and a half to three years versus that five to seven year window. So we say all the time to my homeowner, you know, do you want to be a new homeowner again? Well, I'd really like to be, okay? Would you like to be a new homeowner in five or seven years or two and a half? I'd like to be a new homeowner in two and a half. That's why you do the short sale. The lenders agree to let you walk away, pay your closing fees, report your debt is settled, right? 
The other part of that is, right, I close on my property, right? Uh, last week was, what was the, the 30th of November, okay? I close on my property November 30th as a short sale. Guess what doesn't happen to me in, in this, this, this December? I don't have a 30 day later my credit report because I close. I don't long, I no longer own the home. 90 days after I close, Bank of America is going to go to Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion, and they're going to say, hey, this debt's settled, and that $300,000 mortgage comes off of my credit report. Okay? Two drivers of your credit score, how you pay your debt, your mortgage. If you're not paying your mortgage, you're going to have an impact, right? Late, chart, uh, late payments every month, they bring down your credit score. 30 days after you do the sale, you don't have a 30-day late. Nine days after you do a sale, they go to the credit bureaus and they said $300,000 mortgage is now settled. Big driver is your debt to income ratio. If your debt load drops down by $300,000, right? Here's, here's my debt load, here's my income, drops down, it automatically drives up your score. So people start to see their credit start, start to improve 30 to 90 days after doing the short sale. Foreclosure, like I said, five to seven years, bankruptcy seven years. All right, you want to talk about listing agent role? Yep. So if you are going out, which we talk about it over and over, and if you're going out to meet with somebody, just make sure you get a third party authorization and you can order that payoff. We don't recommend that you even call the bank and um, do a verbal because we have seen now just not one time, at least 20 times, where the person that answers the phone at the bank, they're all reading that unpaid. You must get it in writing, ask that it be emailed to you, ask that it be faxed to you, or ask that it be sent to the seller to get a third party authorization when you meet with them. You want to run your comps the same way you would run the comps as if you were doing a normal listing. Just because it's a short sale doesn't mean the bank you can take, we'll get a call, hey, what's the formula? But you know, all the sales are 200. Do I list it at 150 because it's short sale? Is that like, is there a certain formula? No, you list it at or slightly above market value. And then you want to do price reductions, but you do your normal CMA as you always would. Put it on, and then after a week to two weeks, if there's no interest, you can do a three to five percent price reduction. The bank wants to see small, frequent reduction based on the back that you receive when you have your shelves. They don't want to see you try to list it with what the person owes. They know if they sell it at foreclosure, they can't sell it for any more than the market will bear. So that slightly above and do some more productions. If um, somebody comes in low after a week and they're an investor and they want to fix and flip or get a fix and flip their own, chances are good to know that the bank is going to do a giveaway to allow somebody to make a profit. So be real careful from those investors that are coming in wanting to write low costs because they're coming out immediately. It's fine for an investor to get a deal, but you've got to give it a little bit of a history. The bank is happy to see repair estimates to help justify you. You can give that to the bank's appraiser, but they they want to count for anything cosmetic. If somebody wants to put in only to a kitchen or whatever they want to put in, and they do that on the repair estimate, they're going to strike that off. Um, the, the banks most of the time now will um, will take electronic signatures, but if it's a Wells Fargo, Bank of America, JP Morgan Chase, when you rely on your listing agreement, um, you could get it initially signed electronically. When you send it to them, but if you're doing a short sale, you better call the bank and ask them if they'll accept electronic signatures. Because many times they won't, and that's because of the divorces. This is a risk of seller creating the Gmail account and signing for the other one, and they're not even knowing that they're receiving from the market. That's simply the reason why. And we're seeing it a lot. They have no idea. Yep. Yeah. Um, but my situation, even though uh, the appraiser did the house is free more than the value. I'm a little, yeah, now it's about the mortgage payoff. Um, and I checked my email. I don't see the thing actually giving me that in writing. How do I double check that? Or did they already okay when it's conventional? Is it covering the mortgage? Like they're saying, you have to look pretty way beyond the mortgage payoff. I just want to make sure I'm doing my best. As an agent, especially when I'm new, 
Um, because I check my email and check in when I get in the office um, to see if he um the gentleman from the bank actually gave me a written document that the mortgage payoff sign needs to protect. Um, it's, it's yeah. the mortgage company. Same, same yeah. yeah. So you're dealing directly with you're handling the short sale on your end. No. Mm -hmm. So I was until the lead, uh, they got it appraised by Fannie Mae. Uh -huh. And Fannie Mae said it appraised well enough where he can get a conventional loan. He can, the seller can sell it and not do short sale because it, it appraised, the home appraised. More than what they said he owned. Okay, so then all you need to do is just make sure you reach out to your title company and ask them to pull a mortgage and judgment search because that might be fine that he owes less and you can get it paid off in full. You just want to check in yep. and, I just wanna, I and, and make I sure there's no other liens or judgments or anything else. And you can reach out to Sam Hander, they'll, they'll give you a payoff easily. Email, they email them. I asked for a letter and he didn't. I asked a couple times for him and he said, Are you on file as authorized? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, you, a, yeah. They should typically turn that around within 48 to 72 hours. Right. You should be able to get yeah, which out. Yeah, reach out to the same camera's being emailed. I mean, so they would email that. Right? But to Denise's point, um, you're working with a distressed property owner, get an MJ search up front. I mean, don't go through the entire process. And waiting for the title company to do a full search because at that point if there's judgments or other, other things out there it's too late your deal's going to fall apart right etc someone's not paying a mortgage what else aren't they paying you do not need a full title search you don't need a whole history on the property itself you just want to know the individuals joe and sue homeowner are there any mortgages and judgments on title right now that you need to be aware of okay what we said earlier what else aren't they paying all right, um, protect seller in the sales contract. Um, now, again, if you've ever written on a short sale, you'll see, you know, as is language, right? This is an as is sale, right? In a short sale, the homeowner typically doesn't have any money to make repairs. The bank does not own the home, they own the mortgage note, so they're not making the repairs. So you want to put in the MLS that it is an as is sale and that it's subject to third party lender approval, okay? Buyer and seller sign a contract is not binding until the lender approves it. That's when you get that short sale approval letter spelling out the terms we just spoke about. All right. But the other thing is that um, one of the things that we always recommend is uh, PAR has a short sale addendum. If you have not seen it, if you're writing on a short sale or you're listing a short sale, make sure you incorporate the Pennsylvania Association of Realtors short sale addendum. That has all the language in it that says, everybody, this is a short sale. It's subject to third party, Bank of America, for example, approval, right? It's an as is sale. And the big thing is we always, always try and recommend is one, if you are listing the property, make sure you put that as is language in there and, and inspections as normal, right? Pennsylvania contract, if it's not stated otherwise, you get 10 days, right? 10 days for inspections. You may have some buyers come in and say, well, I'm not gonna spend money on inspections until I know the short sales approved. So they're gonna hang out for 45, 60 days, short sales approved. They're gonna spend the money at that point in time. And then if they wanna walk for inspection purposes, well, they just tied up your seller and they tied it themselves for 45 days or so, right? The flip side of it is they go to inspections and say, you know what, the bank approved 150, but I don't want the property for 150. I want the property for 130. Sorry, the bank's already approved it at 150. You gotta start all over again. The time to negotiate is the beginning. First couple of weeks, put the offer in at 150, go do your inspections. Hey, I still really want the property. It's not worth 150 if you're doing my inspections. I wanna lower my offer. Fine, do a price change addendum. You can negotiate in the beginning. You can't negotiate after a bank's approved. Okay. All right. Uh, disclosures. We already talked about the as is language. Okay. Just a couple other ca caveats. This time of year, right? What we see, the banks go out and they inspect these properties come January and February, and they'll go and they'll winterize them. They'll pop off the locks, put a new lockbox on, and they'll winterize the home. 
I'll put a big sticker on the door. This property has been winterized by a property preservation company. Here's an 800 number. All right. We see that in our area because we're in the Northeast. Pipes freeze. Okay. Don't be freaked out if you have a short sale and the bank comes out and does inspections and they pop the lock off in front of the money. They will give you the code to access uh, access the, uh, the property. Okay. Um, fees that a mortgage lender won't pay. They won't pay somebody's credit card bills. They will not, all right? Um, in the city here, you have condo, things like that. Most lenders will pay up to about six months of past due condo fees if there's a need. They won't pay an assessment fee or anything like that. But how the lenders look at it is if they were to foreclose, lender number one, lender number two, any city taxes, county, school taxes that are open, the lender will have to pay. So all of those can be paid out of a sale, okay? Um, PGW, they have a city water lien. That's that's a lienable item. They will pay that, okay? But there's, you know, things that they consider personal debt. We already talked about repairs, credit card bills. Do um, you guys have an admin fee you charge on top of the commission? They, they will wipe out admin fee all day long. They'll pay the commission that's stated in the listing agreement. Anything over and above that percentage that's listed, they consider added commission. And it, it's unfortunate. It always gets pulled off the settlement sheet the day before closing. All right, so go in with the mind, uh, with your mind wide open. The lender won't pay that um, that admin fee. And they're not even allowed either on the buyer side. So you have to come to an agreement that the buyer pays that as like the POC paid outside of closing on your sheet, but they won't allow it. Yeah, just a couple of things. We've already mentioned some of these. We're coming down to that home stretch here. Um, if you are if you are listing a property, okay. The bank, part of the bank's due diligence, this is the short sale lender, they're going to order an appraisal on the property, right? The appraiser goes out because they don't know what a value of the home is. Let's use Wells Fargo as an example, right? Wells Fargo, their short sale department is Des Moines Iron. They have no idea what it property goes for, right? Up in Richmond or out in West Philly, they have no idea. But these, these lenders all work with these regional vendors all over the country. Regional vendors are the ones that have relationships with the local appraisers, right? Some appraisers, when they go out to these properties, they don't have to even go inside them. They take a picture of the front, take a picture of, of the of the side, the backyard, and they go on to the next one. And they go on at night and they pull comps, determine what value is. We had an appraiser that said there could be a hole in the roof all the way down to the basement. I wouldn't know it, and I wouldn't take it into account unless the agent points out the repairs. The appraiser won't fix everything's in working order. So one of we always recommend if you're listing, that appraiser is your one opportunity, all right, to present comps, to present the sales contract, to say, hey, here's why this property sold for what it is. You may get some appraisers say, well, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to be in like, That's fine. You're there to at least offer and point out, right? Because what's happening now is, there is a limited number of distressed properties. So what the appraisers are doing now, they're not comping this property on other distressed properties. They're comping it on the property down the street that's been completely redone and updated, right? Unless you point out that this property has not been updated. So that's number one. Many of these appraisers, they don't know if it's a short sale. They don't know if it's a bank owned. They don't know if they're doing it for, for like a refi. Right, they just go by and learn. They're in and out of these properties in five minutes. Right, so do do yourself and your client a favor. Try and meet them at the property to point out the, the repairs. Okay, um, we don't see see too many solar panels. Anybody do business out the works? Right, solar panels. Okay, they have thirty year leases. The lenders or the not the lenders, the solar panel companies file what's called a UCC lien. The lien goes with the property. Okay, first time home buyer goes out, their agent doesn't look up and see if they're solar panels. Title company, right, a week or two before settlement says, okay, uh, first time home buyer, we have a, a lease transfer here for the solar panels, right? Well, what's that? We have to pay us, you have to pay the, the solar company $350 a month for the next however many money, however many years we're left of the 30 year lease. 30 years, right? Wait a minute. 
listing agent or buyer's agent wasn't aware of this. Buyer wasn't aware of it. Now I got to go back to their lender and see if they can qualify for that mortgage because they now have a three hundred fifty dollar added expense that they weren't aware of. Right? Denise had a transaction where the listing agent never looked up, the buyer's agent never looked up. All right, and then the title company a week and a half before settlement saw that there was a UCC lien. First time home buyer, dad goes, she's going to be in this house three years. She's not stepping up to a twenty five year lease. It's going to be her problem when she goes to sell. Absolutely. Dad, take them off. Can't take them. They go with the property. Take them off. You damage the roof. All right. Dad's like, I'll pay for them. So dad negotiated to pay off the lease. Dad was a contractor, pulled them off, threw them in the trash, repaired the roof. All right. But you have to be aware because that lease goes with the property. You may only plan on being in the house three, four years, but you're blessing, you, but you're going to pay that lease. On that property, or you have to pass it off to the new buyer. And dad said, We're not going to make their that seller's the problem. My daughter's right. Not everybody has a dad that has the financial needs or the insurance and ability. Okay. All right. That's how you get a hold of us. You got business cards. Um, we always get asked, When do we get you involved? Okay. Um, the earlier on, the better. Okay. Example Denise, Bill. I just spoke to this client. They told me they're behind in the mortgage. I'm not really sure what they owe. Um, I'm going to be meeting with them next Thursday. Give us a call. We'll tell you what questions to ask. All right. Bill and Denise, I just talked to somebody. This just happened the other day. A friend of ours, she's she's a, a, a builder um, in, in Delaware. She calls me, known for years. She's got cousins. It's an estate. Bill, um, I, I, my cousins, their mom passed away. They don't really think there's any money. You know, uh, what can we do? I said, well, get a payoff, right? Do a, an MJ search. Down there, they call it, uh, uh, so it doesn't matter what they call it, it's just an MJ search. Figure out is there anything else that's owed? Okay. Sit down with the adult children. If you need me to call and jump on the phone with them, I will. All right. So, a lot of times, agents will have us jump on a conference call with them and the homeowner to educate them on why a short sale, right? Some of the things we just walked you through. So but the earlier we can get involved, the more help we can provide and give you guidance and give the homeowner guidance. Particularly if you are in a competitive situation. All right, I, I you know, bar none, there's no other company in this area that's been doing it for 20 years. All right. So we're just another arrow in the quick. That's all we got. Everybody, thanks for your time today. Thanks for